Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever time it is, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining this incredible panel. Uh, I will be your moderator today. My name is Cynthia Johnson. I am the CEO and co-founder of an integrated marketing agency called Bell & Ivy out of Los Angeles, California. Um, now, really anywhere I work is. <laughs> and um, Today, we have an excellent panel of people here. Uh, we'll be discussing the not necessarily that the emerging future is bright, but what we can do to ensure that it, it will be. Everyone here has a background in uh, work, entertainment, consulting, uh, and in some cases research around how do you make big change happen, systemic change, not only within an organization, but in society. Uh, but we're going to start by giving everyone a five minute window to introduce themselves, what they do, uh, and a little bit about what they'll be talking about and discussing today on this panel. A little bit about me uh, that's relevant to the panel. In the past six months, I've uh, actually been able to successfully launch a couple of different COVID response programs, uh, one being Project N95. We created a reverse marketplace uh, for small family practices to access uh, uh, PN95 uh, at the same cost uh, as a hospital organization would at wholesale. Another organization that we've launched is the Pivot Project, where we actually tell stories of what we're calling fringe issues around COVID-19. Uh, <coughs> COVID um, and we're connecting them with problem solvers. Through that, we've launched a nonprofit that uh, is basically taking corporate technology, refurbishing and redistributing it to underserved youth, foster youth, um, and underpaid or underfunded uh, school districts throughout the United States. So I believe the future is bright. I know that our panelists believe the future is bright. And I think that this discussion will help all of you to see that um, we're not doomed forever. So <laughs> to kick us off, uh, Edward, I'll pass the mic to you. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much. I'm um, Edward Chandrovich. I'm uh, co-founder and chairman of Notel. Uh, we're one of the largest uh, flexible workplace companies in the world. We were founded um, in uh, 2015, late 2015, early 2016, and uh, have expanded to uh, 20 markets since we since we started. We uh, started in New York and uh, uh, operate throughout North America, Europe. Um, we're actually launching in Australia. We launched in Japan earlier this week. Um, and uh, uh, it's interesting that um, I'm on the panel about uh, the future being bright, given that uh, we're in the business of, um, well, put it bluntly, office. And uh, uh, this virus has really been an office virus. Um, nothing has driven people away from, uh, from the office in the way that, uh, that, this, that this virus has. Uh, we, we, most people were in quarantine, and really, office work has been this uh, construct that has been most affected by um, um, by COVID nineteen. Um, I mean, healthcare and education have been affected, but uh, really, when we speak about work, uh, what has really changed is that we can work virtually. Uh, we can. Um, we can now think about work as something that is being done from our homes primarily, not uh, from the office primarily. And something that uh, came out of, uh, uh, of the quarantine, came out of the pandemic, is this idea of uh, work being remote first. Uh, if you look at the overall market, companies have been spending ten to $15,000 a year on providing workplace for their employees, for 100% of their employees. Uh, that's uh, trillions of dollars. Uh, in fact, the Global 2000 spends about uh, $3 trillion a year on providing workplace to, to their employees. Well, no longer will that capital go primarily to commercial real estate. Uh, companies will still continue to spend on providing workplace to the employees. Uh, they will deliver more perks. 
they uh, they will still compete for talent. We are still in the war for talent. Uh, they will need to recruit and retain employees, and uh, they will not necessarily recruit and retain them by putting them in front of uh, putting them at desks uh, so they sit in front of the computers. Recent studies show that um, only twelve percent of uh, employees want to be uh, working remotely 100% of the time. And 40% of employees want to be working from the office for 100% of the time. So, and, and then you have uh, about 50% that want to be in this uh, hybrid mode, which we're in now. So uh, I think the future for work uh, is very bright. We will continue working. We are uh, ultimately... Um, uh, power engines of the economy. And uh, um, we will uh, work through this, uh, through uh, virtual means, but we'll also have uh, different types of uh, uh, locations, different types, types of uh, maybe touchdown spaces. We will rethink the way we treat office and the way that um, uh, we treat workplace as, uh, as companies and uh, as individuals. But um, ultimately, uh, we will come back. Uh, we will uh, cure our germophobia, uh, which uh, certainly has become more prevalent. Uh, we'll probably put a higher value on private spaces. Uh, I don't know whether uh, co-working or any types of shared office space will survive, but um, certainly we will, uh, we will be... Um, who will come out of this having learned some lessons. Uh, if you think of uh, most crises, um, they ultimately led to something positive. Uh, bubonic plague uh, was the reason um, we have the Renaissance. And uh, it, it was a black swan event before uh, black swan was, was a word. So this black swan, over, uh, this black swan event will certainly lead to positive results. And I think work uh, will, be, um, will be affected in um, unpredictable but extremely positive ways. Yeah, I'm really glad that you are on this um, panel because coming from such an extreme uh, changing and just extremely changing industry uh, and having such a positive outlook and I'm definitely looking forward to diving into more of the statistics you mentioned because I wonder what percentage of uh, decision makers land in office space worker versus remote because that always has a huge impact on what the next move is, right? Um, so thank you for that introduction and I will pass the mic to Gregory. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute. Um, uh, good morning, um, uh, everyone who's down here in uh, the Southern Hemisphere um, in the far, far east. Um, I'm sitting in New Zealand. Um, uh, good evening to everyone up in Europe. Um, my name's uh, Gregory Millen. I've uh, worked for the last uh, 25, 30 years um, in the pioneering, the I suppose, the 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 digital revolution. Um, uh, COVID has sort of brought on um, its full-blown transition into the digital space, uh, which I'll come in into shortly. Um, I personally trained as a visual communicator, um, and uh, the day I uh, graduated, um, I already experienced the future of work by being redundant because um, I was trained um, to do everything with my hand. Um, and uh, the computer arrived um, and kicked off uh, where we are today with the ability to um, hold this uh, international meeting. Um, what um, I work in now, I'm uh, after years of working as a designer, information architect, uh, strategic systems thinker, and a uh, curious self-trained economist is um, looking at um, the, the big moving megatrends that are um, um, coming coming in on us and converging across industries. Um, that's got me to think about um, 
very much that for the last 30 years, we've been shoving bits into atoms, uh, uh, atoms into bits to create this virtual world. Um, technology uh, is moving at uh, such a rate that we are now, I believe, um, getting to a, a cusp moment of being able to extract those bits back out into the physical world. But uh, now we have COVID on our hands. Um, COVID, to me, is um, it's a physical crisis, you know, happening in the physical world. Um, previous crises uh, like the GFC uh, were virtual because money um, is a virtual idea. It's a virtual construct. Um, uh, and the debt that was incurred and is being incurred by both these crises is, is invisible. Um, the, what I see happening uh, right now with the future of work, which is the, the, this, the space that has been heavily affected, as um, Edward quite rightly pointed out, um, is creating what I see a new divide. Um, previous to COVID, um, the divide was... Um, uh, the, the future of work debate was very much about um, artificial intelligence and what that was going to do to people. That debate is still very alive and is now gone on to steroids um, as we all move to the virtual space. Uh, but the, this new divide is those people who need to prosper or are, are now not able to prosper in the physical world. And the physical world is very much about um, a human uh, space and our connection to the natural world, which um, incidentally the resources that uh, we consume in the natural world um, and the energy that we consume um, creates the virtual world. The virtual world wouldn't exist without the physical world. But what I'm curiously very interested in the moment is in the physical world, we use all our five senses. Um, in the virtual world, we only use two, uh, uh, sight and sound. Um, and this uh, brings me to this sort of inflection point um, of where we're going. Um, you know, what will the future of livelihood look like, not the future of work? Um, what does it mean to be alive? in the physical world as opposed to the virtual world. And this dumbing down of our senses that is um, really accelerated um, with COVID, but particularly in the last 10 years uh, with, with the hijacking, I believe, of the word technology. If we split the word technology in half, we've got technical and then we've got knowledge knowledge and um, I, I kind of feel that we need to take stock of of the um, just the the complete rush towards uh, techno evangelism and that we all going to plug and live in this virtual world simply put you cannot bite bites where does food come from how are we going to feed ourselves and how are we going to reconnect back to the natural world from where we belong, uh, have come from. Thank you. No, absolutely. We, we discussed this a bit during the tech run and uh, I'm fascinated by it. And actually, after doing a little bit of research on, on Sandy, um, who will be our next panelist to speak, uh, he talks a lot about how entertainment and storytelling is exactly how we can unite communities and, and inform them in ways that make the information exciting um, and the willingness to learn because it is easy to escape into our virtual worlds, right? And not want to come out. So with that, I will pass the mic to Sandy. Well, first I'd like to thank Frank Jurgens, Richter and Harassus for putting on this amazing conference and bringing people from all over the world and the diversity of information panels and information exchange is remarkable. And, and again, if there's a reason to be optimistic, and this is the optimism panel, um, this conference is a reason to be optimistic. And I'm Sandy Kleiman. I'm the uh, CEO of Entertainment Media Ventures in Los Angeles. 
Um, I have helped run Universal Studios, Creative Artists Agency, MGM, and 40 years in the entertainment industry. What we do is we help build companies in entertainment, technology, education, healthcare, and really, um, you know, the, the, the area that I'm most enthusiastic about, which uh, Cynthia just touched on, is that uh, it is really entertainment that has the possibility and I believe will unite us. In a world of sound bites and stereotypes where basically the news cycle and social media, you know, they have enormous positive aspects and yet they've disappointed us in, in how, you know, I guess the world we see ourselves in today. And frankly, everybody at this conference is a vote of confidence that people will get together in some positive way. And the positive ways that I see are uh, manifold. Firstly, the most exciting thing is that, uh, and it's exemplified across many industries, but certainly in entertainment as well, is that we are now on a global platform. And when I was growing up, if you had a subtitled film and it was made outside the U.S. and it would show in a movie theater in New York on a good day, it might show for a week in L.A., and right now we are watching entertainment from around the world with new faces, not necessarily in the English language, imbuing culture that is localized, but for a global scale. And we are building centers of creative excellence everywhere around the world. And we're really at the beginning of that. But Netflix, 70 percent of its productions outside the United States. And, you know, one of my old colleagues said that I I treated airplanes the way most people treat buses. And I must say in this lockdown, having been unable to travel for 180 days, um, you know, when I'm generally on the road two weeks a month, um, I will say that this transformation of technology has actually allowed me to continue the dialogue around the world, working with people in Indonesia, where we have one creative venture in the Middle East, where we actually not only have creative ventures, but we just launched a film school, online education um, for uh, the Arab world. And we did a summer program with EEI Creative Arts and the MBC Academy out of Dubai. And we're now moving into the fall curriculum with, with five different you know, areas of discipline to train the next generation of creators. Now, when I was an agent, and it, you know, there, not everyone wants to be an agent. I actually loved being an agent. Um, a talent agent, a creative artist agency. I used to represent Robert Redford, De Niro, Kevin Costner, Danny DeVito, directors like Michael Mann. In fact, I partnered with Michael on The Aviator. But what's that much more exciting to me today is that I get to work with the next generation of, of young creators. And those creators have voices that are truly unique. They bring a lifetime of experience. They are not recycling stories. They are not there just to make money. I, I went into this business to make a difference. And as I've said, you know, the sense of optimism, values, the sense of what human potential can do, the, and and the, the the place that gives me the greatest hope, optimism, and, and enjoyment, I might add, is that New, we, we, we go through, as I said, news cycle and social media. It becomes divisive when it shouldn't. It creates stereotypes when they're the last thing we need. But if we tell stories about the human condition, if we talk about families, and the more you travel the world, the more you realize all families want the same thing for their children. Everybody, you know, people are more the same than they are not. And when they are not the same, they enrich each other by sharing their cultures, their values, their histories. And the reality is we are all children of this planet that we must protect. We are all children of the same world that we must embrace. And my optimism is that through storytelling, we will bring people together. It's incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, you're right. Every, I've traveled quite a bit in myself and just the every people everywhere want the same thing. Stability, love, you know, the community of some sort. Um, and, you know, last but not least, introducing Natalie, who is the ultimate um, optimistic dose of realness <laughs> that I've ever met. <laughs> She's a uh, Natalie, I'll let you take it away, but your background is astonishing. It's so broad and so positive, yet um, impactful in ways that I haven't seen in many uh, career paths for someone at your specific age range. So I'll pass the mic to you. 
Thank you. Um, hi guys, I'm Natalie Byrne. I'm also based in Los Angeles. So we have the West Coast optimism. I think that's why <laughs> people for the future from entertainment to innovation to Silicon Valley. Um, so excited to be here. Uh, I lead Blank Space, which is a great way to, to kind of segue the conversation because we work at the intersection of impact, culture, um, and capital. So we work with very big brands. Um, I was at Unilever before leading brand purpose in the prestige for portfolio and thinking about the future of brands from leadership to product to consumers and how we operate in communities um, and the impact that we can create. Uh, I work really closely with the United Nations um, and that sustainable development goals and thinking about the intersectionality of of this work, you know, whether it's gender, whether we're looking at race, whether we're looking at climate, health, food security, none of these things can happen unless we're actually connecting the dots across. Um, so we work with big brands as well as people of influence, whether family foundations, we work with funds um, and some powerful voices standing in the entertainment industry. Um, for us, unless you are here to make a difference and use your yourself, your capital, your voice um, as a huge megaphone and a pipeline for solutions, um, that that's the bar that we've, we've come to know. And it's been really interesting doing this work for so long and watching now the emergence of like the impact industry, if you will, where a marketing um, agency or branding agency or a PR agency or storytelling now has to have a division where someone specializes in good. Now, I hate that word. I think doing good is really past day. It's actually about business and the future of business and relevancy there. So when I think about the emerging future and how where we're headed, I get really excited because a brand is going to be obsolete if they're not thinking about the impact they have, if they're not thinking about their supply chains, if they're not thinking about what's in their product, how their product affects me. Um, and when we look at the future of a consumer, really, this is about citizenry. I mean, we've never been more interconnected. Like, I was so happy to go last because I'm able to take so much of what everyone said and think about, you know, how this new interconnectivity um, and almost relating virtually to, but with people all over the world in a much easier way. I mean, it's changed not only the way we work, but the way that we think, the way that we live to everyone's point who went before me. Um, I'm really excited because what I see happening on the forefront is collaboration and integration. Um, you know, whether it's a celebrity client or a big brand um, or even a private foundation, we're building cross sector coalition. So we're saying, what do we bring to the table and who can help us do this better? Um, and that to me is actually how we accelerate change. Uh, previously, I worked very closely with past administrations here in the United States um, and from, of course, bringing the business sector to the forefront and the entertainment. I actually worked in television for a while and public affairs around this work um, to, you know, the White House or to the U.N. or in international conversations with the State Department and bringing folks on the ground to say this is this is what's happening here and what's happening there and how can we bridge these relations. So all that said, we're in this really interesting time where everything is kind of blowing up and systems aren't working anymore. And we get to look at that. And again, I can't stress enough, loving that we're on the West Coast panel that, <laughs> I mean, New Zealand is going to be West Coast too. <laughs> so we're just thinking about how, how can we help innovate? How can we think big in, in, in the place where um, these huge visionaries have come before us and changed the way we've done things? That's what I see happening now. And the best part is that we're not going to redo the things the way they are. And we have new voices and new ages and new races and new ideas coming forward and being heard. So I'm definitely the optimist on the panel. <laughs> Yes, very excited. But yeah, again, the, just the realness. But we have to think about specifically how we're going to pull this off. And is it sustainable? And that's really what I love about hearing from you. It's it's so clear. It's positive, yet it doesn't feel disconnected um, in your in your speech. And one question I have listening to all of you when you talk about how a greater number of people actually prefer being in an office than to a complete remote, remote lifestyle, or how do we come and innovate or keep livelihood ahead. Maybe I'll, I'll direct this at, at Edward first. Um, how do we ensure that we're not putting solutions on top of people instead of creating solutions that people really want and need or leaving behind another generation that maybe isn't ready for innovation? Maybe they, they want that work from anywhere or um, opportunity to go back to a what was s s somewhat normal. Yeah, I, I, uh, I want to riff off what uh, Gregory said. Um, because I, I, I really like the idea uh, where I, I was actually I didn't think about this uh, uh, before this panel, uh, which is which 
uh, it's amazing that, that we're having it because um, you, I mean, you spend some time learning. Uh, but the idea that uh, our communication, this communication, has been dumbed down to two senses. So uh, we're really using a very narrow protocol. Um, we will want to come back. We'll want to be, uh, we, we are physical creatures and we will want to be in a physical environment. Uh, so um, I, I think that um, we just need to experiment. Um, everything that, uh, uh, everything that, everything great that we do comes out of uh, experimentation and um, evolution and uh, diversity. Uh, we need to have, uh, uh, we, we need to experiment with, with uh, different options. Uh, as far as solutions that are being put in front of us, I think everyone has their own, everyone has realized that they have their own style of work, their own style of communication. Um, they uh, treat their colleagues differently. Some people, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm often on uh, on Zoom calls or these uh, around the world calls uh, where people uh, turn off their camera. Some people turn on, some people have their camera all, on all the time. That tells a lot about the people, how they engage, uh, what their background is. Some people use virtual backgrounds. Some people never do. Like on this, uh, on this call, it's amazing that none of, uh, none of the people are using virtual backgrounds. Um, you, um, because that further isolates you. Um, so it's, I, I think that we, uh, through this, um, through this pandemic, through this experience of us being individuals, we, uh, I, I think we, we're coming to understand that, uh, diversity really matters. Um, that we are all completely different in, in, and even we're, we're seeing these differences through this very narrow, Two cents protocol. Uh, imagine how great it will be when we're actually back in the physical world after we've all been vaccinated. Um, it'll be it'll be such a party. <laughs> yeah, such a. I mean, I, I fall more into the line of like I'm all remote work all day. I can get so much done in a day now. But <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm curious when you said this, this is earlier. I was like, who wants to be in an office? But I think you're an office person. Um, so that's why it's just no, no, no. I actually, actually, no? I'm not an office person. I've been working, I've been working remotely most of my life, but I also know how uh, large companies operate. And uh, if you, if you're a company that hires ten thousand people a year, you want to have some physical contact with them. How do you, um, how do you uh, bring culture to them? How do you tell them what what your company is about? Um, how do, how do you bring them into your community? Uh, I mean, we've all seen these virtual communities, but um, they're also real communities in the real world. Yeah, we have a question actually from the audience, and this might be a great question for you, Sandy um, or, or Gregory. So uh, speaking about diversity, which doesn't matter, don't you think that globally there is less diversity today that, than in the time before? More or less diversity globally? I think that ties to what Edward was just saying. And let me tie them together and where you were. Firstly, it's not about office versus not office. I'm hoping people come out of this, whatever this is for them. With a, when you would go to the office, when you had a routine in your life before it was disrupted, you basically took every m – many people take things for granted. Everything is as it was. You don't see things in depth. You shorthand things. You say good morning and there's, you know, you know nothing more about the person you just waved at. And the, the, the lack of human engagement is probably the hardest part about what's going on right now. The sense that what was normal, you no longer can take for granted that you can hug someone and not have to think about it ahead of time if you can do it at all. And I think that speaks to diversity as well. I think that... Um, there is more diversity today in many places, and there is certainly a yearning for diversity where there is no diversity. And I think that our heightened sensitivity to the human condition about being locked down and locked up should make our desire for our hunger for diversity 
for new thoughts, people, experiences, emotions. If anything else, we are sensorily deprived, right? And certainly I am. I'll speak for myself. I'm sensorily deprived in ways that, you know, you know, even, even the introverts I know are having trouble. And what I would say is that we, you know, look, the Motion Picture Academy, the television industry, the dialogue that's going on in the United States right now, and I can speak to the U.S. because I'm sitting in the middle of it, is, is a very complex dialogue about diversity that goes back hundreds of years and human rights and, you know, the sense of egalitarianism. I mean, if you think about the life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and you say there's less diversity today, and you're, then you're not truly celebrating the life of a woman who started in a world where women had no place, where you could be at a Harvard Law School class and the professor looks at you and say, why are you taking, or Columbia, why are you taking the place of a man? Why are you wasting our time? Which was true in medicine, true in law, true in business. And yet today, even if it's not equal, we are at a point at which the dialogue should help make it all not equal, but engaged, enriched, and we should be looking at people through the eyes of, you know, experience and what they can contribute rather than their family heritage or their education. I'll leave with two quick thoughts that Google has said that they, you no longer need a college degree to come work here is a simple acknowledgement of the fact that they're looking at what you can do, not where you come from and who you are. That Goldman Sachs has said, we're somewhat skeptical and we're not sure we're going to hire any more MBAs. Again, what creates diversity? Engagement with life, not degrees and things that create silos and differentiation. It's a sense of what you can do and with whom. And if you don't recognize the value of what others can do with you and for you, then you will miss out on the future. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's incredible. And let's steer the conversation away from work for a second, actually, because I think you make a great point, Sandy. It's not about necessarily what work is. Work is a means to a life and not necessarily should be the other way around. And um, Gregory, I know you, you speak to this a lot is, you know, what is the future of livelihood? How do we, how do we pull people away from their tablets and uh, engage in the real world, whether that's gardening or, you know, having a six foot uh, social distance conversation with your neighbor? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I've got the answer of how, but um, I'll, I'll go down the path of something um, Sandy just touched on about this uh, sensory starved situation that everyone is in, and very much um, I would I would I would sense that most of us are, are knowledge workers. I I wonder about the people who actually um, thrive and are passionate um, about their livelihood, um, their way of life, um, which it's not a job. It's a job, of, it's a, a work of passion in the physical world, and that's just been removed right now. Um, and they're, they're faced with um, having to be virtualized, so to speak, or, or sit in front of a desk and find a new uh, livelihood to see the immediate future out. Um, so it sort of, uh, you know, raises this kind of more of a question um, in my mind. I, I don't call it the, the the lockdown. I call it the great lockout. Um, the, it's, it's just basically locking not just uh, you out from your neighbour, uh, which I've experienced in, in my very, very, um, I suppose, naturally physical distancing neighbourhood, um, the you know, and and the, the the vernacular that as we move forward is terribly important. Um, the term social distancing is to me a false positive, um, in the sense that that what is required today is to come together more socially cohesive. Um, uh, you know, it's even looking beyond diversity. It's looking beyond diverse, I suppose, cohesiveness between everyone and um, equality um, and that's that's only going to happen um, you know by allowing us to operate again in the physical world so it's it's a it's, I suppose it's, it's quite a dilemma that we're actually in in this sort of hanging moment of, of pause and um, 
I suppose, deep consideration moment in time. Um, so uh, I, I'm not sh really sure how we're going to get there, but um, I'm, I'm op optimistic of the technology that is being developed um, uh, today and and coming down and looking at, at the base needs um, of uh, human existence or or you know, if we look look to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we we are now in a in a space of developing better shelter, uh, growing better food, and hopefully um, uh, providing better health uh, to 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 everyone, so we can get out there and and take the world to um, a more integrated, um, uh, cohesive, uh, and diverse space. And. I wonder too, Natalie, this directing to you and, and of course then to the room, um, the brands, the investors, and all of the groups that you're working with, uh, how have you seen uh, them participating in sort of the solution or you know helping whether it's their employees or um, their organizations or people within it to live better lives? You know, work, work life balance and culture is um, definitely taking on a new meaning these days. Uh, have you seen any any successful initiatives in, with any of the companies you've worked with? Yes. Um, yeah. And just quickly to go back to the conversation on livelihoods, <clears throat> I think that this great pause that we've had to take both from travel um, in business, everyone's reevaluating their their bottom line and, and what the future of that looks like, whether it's coming on to sell in e-commerce for the first time or or thinking about the sustainability again of their supply chain when, and, and manufacturing, ingredients, all of that. I think that to the livelihoods point, this has really helped people to kind of sit back and say, what am I doing to contribute to my own, um, you know, sense of success or happiness or peacefulness? Um, how, how have I cultivated a life like this? Uh, where do I work and, and how did they, are they looking out for me um, in the future? Whether it's, the, the future sustainability of their business, their chasins that, that make up this engine. Um, from a personal standpoint, I, I love it because it's actually pushing people to really question where they are and what matters. Um, and in this extra time or space away, you cultivate more creativity. I mean, we've been in a overly distracted um, society for a very long time. And you know, we're, we're seeing breakout voices, breakout storytelling, breakout inter, inter, interventions um, in business where people are seeing a gap between what the nonprofit industry did and what the business industry did and gaps that we could fill, like platforms coming out around food waste, food delivery to the poor, things like that. I think that this creativity and this um, cultivation of who we are as ourselves, uh, a reflective period that's really been forced upon the world has helped grow our capacity for change how we're contributing to the macro um so that to me has been really again a very big positive uh from the business standpoint of course they have to figure out how not to have burnout from you know zoom videos all day um and be able to but a lot of people have had to shift employee numbers um change roles change the way that they're thinking about the future of the business and that takes investment. So you're looking at, you know, moving maybe some marketing PL that would have been on shelf or in, in um, maybe a Super Bowl ad and pulling it aside to say, what are we actually doing to contribute to the positive benefits that are needed for COVID right now? If you saw in the last four months, brands were coming out everywhere, um, even ones that were incredibly hurt. One like a great example I love is Makers Mark, who um, pooled all of their marketing budget for the year to give in small towns to restaurant. Um, food workers that were out of business and make sure that they had food to eat. So that's somebody who said there's no amount of advertising for our product that could replace being a part of this moment. Um, so I think that brands are thinking about their role, transparency and visibility in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen the same. And I think we, I hope we hold on to that post, you know, post COVID because there's going to be a constant changing world. You know, we have still have climate change to deal with and, so many other things. And uh, Sandy, Edward, Gregory, Natalie, thank you so much for your time today. It's really, truly invaluable. Um, we are, our time is up, but um, 
you know, I believe everyone can connect with you uh, via the app. And um, thanks again Thank for, for joining us. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Everybody do a random act of kindness today. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Oh, we're still here. Okay. Wait. Bye. No, oh, this is great. By the way, Cynthia, if you could circulate everybody's, like, we may have their contact information, but it would be great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I will I'll shoot email over to everyone this afternoon. Natalie, let's go. We'll figure a way to, to, to not be in an infectious world in L.A., and we'll figure out how to do some good. Social okay. distance, yes. We can there do an out, outdoor hey, cup of coffee. I'm in L.A., too, so if you guys you know, want a third and there's a room at the table, let me know. Nice. <laughs> Amazing. Harass us get together in L.A. <laughs> Where are you guys physically in L.A.? Uh, I'm in Marina Del Rey. And you are, Natalie? Bel Air. Bel Air, but that's home. Where's the office? Office is um, right on Sunset by, uh, like, right across from Soho. In West, uh, West Hollywood, yeah. yeah. And by the way, we all want to go to New Zealand, so just don't, just yeah. make no mistake about it. Been there, done that, want to go back, won't let us back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're I'm, not allowed I'm just, in. I'm just a short swim off uh, Long Island Beach down there, somewhere D down there. <laughs> just somewhere down there. We love yeah. it. <laughs> all right. You guys are great. Thank you. Yeah, Bye. Bye, guys.